Hello! It's that time of year when I talk to you about my favourite books of the year. Now I had big plans for this, I was going to do my favourite audiobooks, my favourite books, my least favourite books, all of that stuff. And to be honest, it just hasn't happened. I haven't had the time, I haven't had the brain space. However, I'm still gonna do a kind of favorite books video. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I usually like to do my 10 favorite books of the year. Um, Last year I don't think I quite made it to 10, but this year I'm even further off, sadly. Um, it was going really well actually, and I was on track to have enough to talk to you about um, by about August, because I kind of keep a tally and make sure that I'm writing down the books that um, do speak to me the most, which is interesting both for making this video easier to film, but also for seeing which books don't actually stand the test of time, um, because I often end up crossing a few out and wondering why I've put a few on there. Anyway, long story short, I was on track to have 10 or more books to talk to you about by about August um, and then things really petered out with my reading and I, ha I don't think I read, no, the last book I've written on here I read in I think August or maybe the start of September but I'm pretty sure it was the end of August. Um, so, you know, that's not great but let's just we're not going to dwell on that um also i'm going to put one of the books um or mention one of the books that i have crossed out since writing it down um not recently I'm, i've obviously gone back to the list and crossed it out throughout the year um so i'm going to talk to you about that also i will say disclaimer i don't have any of the books here they are all in storage at the moment we are currently doing work on our house as you can see plastering and stuff needs doing so i'm not getting my books out because they will be absolutely ruined um so what i'm gonna try and do is the fancy jazzy techie stuff which i used to be able to do quite easily which is to put the book covers on either side when i'm talking about the books however it's been a few years since i've done that so i'm not going to promise that i i will be able to do that but i will try if not all of the books will be linked down below um so if you're ever confused about what i'm speaking about you can just check it out down there so the first book I read down this year was The Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. Hopefully it's appearing somewhere. This is the first in Robin Hobb's Life Ship Traders series and I have to say I've had Robin Hobb on my radar for a while. I've had this book on my shelf for a while but I can't show you because I don't have it but it's like that thick. It's very very thick. Um, so I've kind of been putting it off and then after some bad times and some reading slumps this year I decided to pick it up because I really just wanted a fun fantasy book that I could just lose myself in and have fun with and that's exactly what this book is. Now I'm not a huge fantasy fan especially really heavy thick fantasy I find dull to be honest. Um, I just find a lot of fantasy books are far too long and longer than they need to be but this book I just adored. I swept through it and it was such fun. So basically this is a series. It is a fantasy but it's not like overly fantastical. There are fantastical elements and it is like an alternative world but it doesn't isolate you. It doesn't feel too dissimilar from our world um, and we predominantly follow the story of these live ships which are sort of a key feature in this world um, and they are passed from generation to generation they're made from a special kind of wood and basically that wood quickens um, after so many people from the family have died on its decks and the um, masthead of the ship becomes a not a living creature exactly but it it, it is able to talk to people, it can pick up on the feelings of its um, captain and it kind of becomes entwined with its captain. And the ships do effectively become characters in this story. Um, we follow predominantly in this book um, one family where the daughter has always wanted to be the helm of this live ship but she's the girl of the family and that's never going to happen. Um, and we follow what happens when the live ship quickens um, and even the live ship expects the girl to be there and the girl is not there and it looks at what happens because these live ships can quite easily get unhinged um, if their captains are unhinged. They're they can pick up on that and and they have been known to kill and stuff um so we kind of look at what happens and how that live ship keeps her sanity whether she keeps her sanity and we also follow a pirate who is um trying to capture a live ship basically he's made it his um pirating mission to capture a live ship which i don't think has ever been done before because live ships are incredibly fast um so yeah that's basically the premise of this this book um 
I just adored it. It was so much fun and I instantly just loved the world. So much so that I went out and bought the second one, um, which I read a few months later. I didn't enjoy the second one as much, though I did still love it. Um, but yeah, they're just so fun. I think anyone who has Robin Hobb on their hate radar but has been holding off, I would definitely recommend these books. I think most people say that these are um, the Live Ship Traders and the Farseer Trilogy are the ones that I've heard the most about. But I think the Live Ship Traders kind of seems to be up there for a lot of people. So I would recommend starting there. Then I've got The Importance of Music to Girls. I think this is why by Lavinia Greenlove. As I say, I will link it somewhere. It's really hard not having them. Um, so this is, it's one that I probably, I don't know. I, th I think it does deserve its place here. It's probably less there than the others. Um, basically, this is a sort of memoir um, written by Lavinia Greenlove, who is a, a sort of poet, creative, artistic person. Um, and she's effectively telling us about her relationship with music as she grew up, what music meant to her, and how it, it rescued her from certain situations. Now, I'm not overly into music, so I wasn't overly thinking that this was going to be my kind of thing, but actually when I started reading it, it's just written so beautifully. And yes, there is this underlying tone of all about music and about her relationship with music, and she references songs and how music makes her feel. But she also talks so candidly about the experience of growing up and I think especially the experience of growing up female um and I just adored it I think there was some parts in here where I just really really related I think it captures perfectly that feeling of being kind of isolated um of, of struggling to fit in and kind of finding your place in something like music um that is outside of all the other stuff going on and can really help you to work out who you are I would highly recommend it. It's really short. I think I read it in one or two sittings. Um, it took me like two hours or so. It is tiny, um, but it, it was so good. It was so good. It's just so well written. Like, even if it doesn't sound like it's going to be your kind of thing, I can almost recommend that you will find something in here to recognise and to associate with. Then I've got The Collector by John Fowles. Now, this is another one that has been on my shelf for the longest time, and ever since I got it, I haven't been overly pushed to pick it up. It was a book that sounded interesting enough that I bought it when I saw it, um, but it hasn't been exactly on my radar for reading desperately. Um, but then I realised that I have had it for about five years, so I got to it finally, and I am so glad I did. This book was so good. Um, the best thing I can describe it as is a mix between, like, You by Carolyn Kepnes um, and kind of a bit Lolita-esque. It's so good. So basically this looks at effectively Stockholm Syndrome. This man captures this girl. This is where I try and remember what happened because I did read this in like February. Um, this man ends up capturing this girl because he's become obsessed with her um, and he's not fully, I don't know, he's a little bit um, not all there. There's something going on with him. You can, you can sense that he's not altogether right in his mind. Um, and he ends up capturing her and we, from what I can remember, we see it all from his perspective. So it does that fantastic thing that you does where it kind of makes you really associate with the character and really sympathise with him, even though he's doing these absolutely horrendous things and he does really horrendous things to this girl. Um, but you kind of see it because you're seeing it from his perspective and he doesn't realise that what he's doing is so twisted. Um, you know, he thinks he's doing it for them and for her. Um, you kind of just start to really feel sorry for him and understand him, which is really <laughs> quite disturbing. And it's interesting the girl's reaction as well, because obviously at first she's fighting against him. And this is where I guess the Lolita element comes in. She's fighting against him and she, she wants to get out. And then she realises that they are there together. Um, she may as well try A, to understand him and B, to get in his good books so that she can escape. Um, and as I say, my memories of this book aren't great, but from what I can remember, she kind of ends up not sympathising with him, obviously. She doesn't fall in love with him or anything like that, but she kind of comes to understand him and they develop a relationship of sorts, not... I don't know that you could go as far as to say it's a romance or that she has feelings for him, but they definitely develop a bravado, a relationship. Um, you know, he starts letting her into his house and she goes for baths and stuff and she doesn't escape. Um, and it's really interesting to see how that dynamic works out and how 
what we learn about each of the characters through that dynamic it's just a fascinating fascinating character study if nothing else and it's perfectly dark and i love a dark novel so yeah i would really recommend it again it was one that really took me by surprise but i loved um then i've got a god in ruins by kate atkinson um i've put a question mark by this because I don't know that it overly stuck with me and I think the ending of the book very much pulled it together for me. I think up till then it was kind of a four, it was really good but I wasn't convinced that it was going to be like a top book of the year um, and then the ending was so beautiful and poignant that I just had to put it in my top books but I have put a question mark by it so it was an iffy one. Um, I have previously read um, Life After Life by Kate Atkinson and really enjoyed it and actually reading A God in Ruins I realised that um, for me I think she's one of the best sort of popular authors that we've got writing at the moment because she's just so beautiful with language and observation and she just really gets in people's heads now i'm going to be totally honest and i think this is probably why i put a question mark by this book i can't remember anything really that happens in it um i think effectively it's just a life study so in life after life um we follow a woman in a range of different um lives and what happens if she goes down different paths and it's kind of a what if scenario um which is really interesting and i love the premise and i love how it's executed and it really makes life after life stand out in my memory this book um is kind of a follow-on but not i don't think you need to have read life after life to understand this book um but basically the girl or the woman in um, life after life has a brother who is missing for a lot of the book um, and then he comes back and he I think he's called Teddy is the main character in the God in Ruins and we basically look at his entire life um, and what has shaped him what has made him who he is how his legacy goes on in the world and it's just a really large scope book um, which is fantastic and it gives you a really wonderful picture and it's a really deep and rich experience but it also does go on a little bit um, and it doesn't obviously have as much narrative drive as Life After Life um, so for that reason it did fall flatter than that book for me but it's still beautiful and it's still wonderful and there are still some just some of those moments where you're reading and you just have to stop and take that sentence in and read it a few times because it is so poignant and I think that's what Kate Atkinson is really fantastic for I just I adore her I think she's excellent and I, I do think obviously she's very popular but I do think she's underrated in terms of how good a writer she is and yeah I just I, I love her I, I'm definitely going to be picking up more by her then I've got House of Spirit by Isabella Lende now I don't usually have a book that I'm like this was my absolute favourite for the year but I think this was my absolute favourite for the year so again I've had this on my shelf for a while not gonna lie I bought it because it's Jane the Virgin's favourite book I read it because Jane the Virgin ended and I was sad about that um <laughs> so I wasn't overly expecting a lot um and I kind of thought especially from hearing what it was about um, that it was just going to be a kind of cheap imitation of 100 Years of Solitude, which I read the year before. So I was hesitant to pick it up, but I did. And I'm so glad I did. Yes, it's impossible to deny that there are very much 100 Years of Solitude crossovers in here. And not just because they are both set in Latin America and they are both magical realism. But also, you know, I think Eliz Isabella Lundy has purposefully put in kind of nods to 100 Years of Solitude in there. Especially at the start. The first quarter or so is kind of close to the bone with how similar it is. But then this book takes on a world all of its own. Um, it's basically just a multi-generational um magical realism book that looks at a kind of wealthy family and what happens to them and how they get caught up in politics um and magical stuff that occurs um i think that's the most i can say about this book um it's just fantastic it's so gripping and so good and what i liked about this um the magical realism in 100 years of solitude is undeniably and it's not like it's overly subtle a lot of the time there are people levitating and living for hundreds of years um and and going through all these periods of history and it's it's in a made up place um but if you blinked or didn't know that it was a magical realism novel you could almost read the evidently magical bits as just metaphor and you would would not feel like you were in a magical world um which i think is really clever um and i think that's kind of what works with 100 years of solitude because 
you know, it was like the first big magical realism book. So if it had gone all out with the wham, um, it would have isolated people. As I say, once you read into the magical realism, there's a lot of it, but it, it is under the surface. It's always under the surface. With House of Spirits, I feel like Isabella Lende went right further um, and did kind of bam you with magical realism but I think that really worked and I would actually say that this is probably a more accessible book um for more people than 100 years of solitude um yeah I just adored it it was so good I would say it probably piked 100 years of solitude for me I mean that was a fantastic book and it was one of my favorites of last year um and obviously as it's the sort of source material you can't you can't judge but I think A House of Spirits, as I say, it was more accessible, it was an easier read, it was less of a challenge at times, and yeah, I just, I just loved, I loved it. And then finally on my list that's a definite, I've got Sula by Toni Morrison. Now, obviously Toni Morrison passed away earlier this year, so of course I picked up one of her books. Um, I've got a few on my shelf because every time I see a Toni Morrison, I just pick it up. She was a fantastic writer, and I've previously read Beloved and um, The Bluest Eye by her, I think that's all, um, and I absolutely adored Beloved. The Bluest Eye sadly didn't stick with me, but I thought, because I hadn't heard anything about Sula, I didn't think it was going to be one of her best, but I have to say it's gone on to beat Beloved for me. I really adored this book. It's only a short little book, um, and it basically looks at female friendship. Um, I, I couldn't tell you much more than that, because again, it's been a while since I read it. But we predominantly follow this female friendship um, between these girls in a, in a small town um, and basically looks at how they interact with each other, how they go on to live their lives and as you can expect from Toni Morrison there is plenty of poverty in here, there is plenty of racism in here and there is plenty of misery which I really loved um, and there's one particularly scene that I remember um, that is a death scene and it was just done so so beautifully. Um, I think it's it's yeah, it's one of the best death scenes I've ever read and to have read that just after Toni Morrison had died herself um, because the death is told from the perspective of the character who is dying. Um, it was quite emotional to read that at that time and it, it was just fantastic. So yeah, I, as I say, I haven't heard much personally about Sula but I really, really enjoyed it. For the masses, obviously, Beloved is like the one um, for good reason but I think Sula definitely deserves more attention than it gets. And then the one that I've crossed out was Swimming Lessons by Deborah Levy. Um, this is about a girl um, called Kitty who basically ends up hijacking the, the holiday of this family. She ends up just swimming in their pool when they get back. Um, it, they're holidaying in France and they end up letting her stay and it looks at how she impacts their lives, um, who she is, why she's there and also the effect that she has on their dynamics and them as people. The reason that I crossed it out and didn't want to include it was because I couldn't avoid the fact that this book is pretty much just like The Accidental by Ali Smith and I'm pretty sure that The Accidental came first. Um, the premise is exactly the same where in The Accidental where Amber ends up stumbling into this family home and they let her stay and she's basically a catalyst for the breakdown of that family. Um, so I couldn't avoid those similarities. I would say awkwardly that Swimming Lessons I think was written better, I think it was better developed as a idea but it, it's definitely the same idea so it kind of was awkward for me to put it on my favourites. However, I'm going to mention it as like an honourable mention because it was really good and I really enjoyed Deborah Levy's writing style, I'm definitely going to be reading more of her um, so yeah I thought it deserved it deserved a brief mention. So those are my favourite books of the year. Um, not the best and I'm sorry that I couldn't remember much from them but you know it's been a hectic year and I haven't got them here to refresh me so we're just guessing. Hopefully I've been able to do the techie stuff and you've been able to see the covers. If not I apologise you know brain. Um, Please let me know down below what your favourite books of the year have been or if you have read any of these and loved them too and I will see you next time. Bye!